Awesome. Well, hello and welcome to the Eagle and Child podcast. I'm your host, Leila Nahavandi, and I am super excited today to be joined by one of my great friends, Pastor Austin Malt. Uh, he is a pastor in the Northwest in the US. Um, he's just become an associate pastor after 12 years in youth ministry. Uh, he's known as the famous um Theos Youth Pastor on Instagram as well, and has a beautiful family out there as well. So welcome, Pastor Austin. It's so good to have you with us. Layla, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I I feel honored and um to be on the Eagle and Child podcast. I don't I don't know anything about anybody, so I have no idea why you chose me, but um, I'm glad to be <laughs> you here. You know lots of things. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're awesome. And um, you've also been part of the, the Theos U crew for a while. How did you get started with that um, Theos Youth Pastor Instagram? How did that become a thing? Well, people do ask me quite a bit how I got like associated with, like, how do I know, you know, the Pinocchios or like this whole thing? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, my my parents are a part of a network called MFI Ministers Fellowship mm-hmm. International, based out of Portland, Oregon. His parents have an MFI church as well, so we've known each other yep. for a very long time. The Theos Youth Pastor Instagram account, which <laughs> is is so funny because it's not like it has like a million, like not you know that's an exaggeration, but it's not like it has even a hundred thousand followers. But it maybe it's because such it's such a niche, like yeah. thing the amount of people like <laughs> that have seen it is crazy to me at times yeah, so it's um, they literally just asked me because i would post funny stuff on my instagram or stuff yeah. i thought was funny i yeah, literally liked i would dance while mowing the lawn and i like and would make it a video and so they just said hey do you want to make stuff about youth ministry i'm like oh that's so easy because i love youth ministry <laughs> yeah there's so many there's so many funny cultural things and oh. sometimes i will i will just say this people sometimes think that, that they don't follow me or whatever and they'll comment and they think i'm like making fun of christians and i'm like dude every one of these like i do a video where i'm like hey, amen wow you know going to a charismatic yeah. church wow 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 and i'm like <laughs> Literally, if you're sitting next to me in church on a Sunday, that's, that's me, actually yeah. me. Yeah. That's why it's same, funny. Same. Yeah. I'm like, I don't have to even act for this. So yes. anyways, just that's pulling just, content out of your real everyday yeah. life. I'm like, what did I do this week? Yeah. Oh, I'll do that. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's how so it started. Good. That's how the account started. So. Oh, it's such a blessing, such a blessing. And I'm super excited today because we're going to dive into John Wesley. So um, how did you get into John Wesley? Why do you like John Wesley? I don't know who he is. I just did went to <laughs> chat G, GPT and I was like, <laughs> I'm being interviewed on this podcast. What do I need to say about John <laughs> yeah. Wesley? And so yeah. let me go through my bullet points. No, um, <laughs> no. Uh, ironically, like I was actually talking to, <laughs> I'm not trying to make everything about the OCU, <laughs> yeah. but um, I was, I was talking with Nathan in Port, Nathan Pinocchio in Portland. Um, this was probably, I think back in like 2014. And I was talking mm-hmm. to him about um, Romans nine and viewing it as a corporate or individual election, you know, in this whole mm-hmm. theological discussion. And yes. And I was telling him how I'm not Calvinist and I'm close mm. to an Arminian, but I have problems with this, that, the other. And he said, mm. you're not Arminian. I said, okay. He goes, you're Wesleyan. Mm. And I'm like, mm. what? <laughs> I knew who John Wesley was. Yeah, I knew what's he was part difference? of the Methodist. Yeah. <laughs> I knew he was part of the Methodist movement. I just didn't know anything about him. So yeah. I, so anyways, because of that, I went and just read briefly, not tons on John Wesley mm-hmm. and what he thought about the interaction between grace mm-hmm. and the providence mm-hmm. of God and man's free will. And I found it very interesting. And then I realized a lot of the stuff he implemented and started as like impacted the entire evangelical movement. I had yeah. no idea. It was fascinating to me. So I'm not, mm-hmm. you know, some, ex- I'm not an expert on anybody or anything, but I'm definitely not an expert on John Wesley, but I have read some of the stuff and it was fascinating to see how it has integrated into much of the evangelical world, especially North yeah. America. Totally, totally. Yeah, awesome. So maybe if you could give us like a little bit of a background sort of bio on jo- John Wesley, who is he? Where did he come from? Um, yeah. Yeah. 
he, Why he likes <laughs> he likes long walks on the beach. No, um, yeah. John Wesley. <laughs> if there's any ladies John- out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we looking um, for a dead he- re- revivalist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Good. Trust me, ladies, he's amazing. Um, yeah. No, <laughs> he he, um, he he's he grew up in an Anglican home. He mm-hmm. had a lot of brothers and sisters. Um, I know that he, I know that he was pretty well educated. Like he went to Oxford before he went to Oxford. Where was it? I don't remember the, I don't remember the name of the school or anything like that, but I believe it was in London. He started studying like Latin and Mm -hmm. classical literature at the age of like 12. So he was pretty well educated. And, um, essentially the backdrop to his whole life. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm obviously going to be um, jumping over a lot of details here, but hitting some of the highlights. Yeah. He was part of what's called uh, the Holy Club, I think is what it was called, Mm -hmm. if I can remember correctly. This group in college that were devoted to like spiritual practices and disciplines Mm -hmm. and, you know, really emphasized uh, a personal relationship with Jesus and a personal relationship with God. And, um, you know, yeah, so that was kind that that holy club that he had with this group mm-hmm. of guys um there was accountability they off they went to they went to multiple church services a week if they could they they did they did fasting they did bible study they prayed they you know they, and they held each other accountable to all these things and this was really the thing that kind of framed the trajectory theologically mm-hmm. and you know philosophically when it comes to how he did ministry so yeah. the uh, so to speed up a little bit now he gets ordained um as a deacon and then a priest within the Anglican church he mm-hmm. goes to uh Georgia for about 10 years to minister to um people f- who had, you know who had came from Anglican churches from where he's from and they were in Georgia he was there for about 10 years on his next trip this is the famous story that if you know anything about John Wesley mm-hmm. you know this Yes. He's on a ship with some oh, German speaking Protestant okay. <laughs> and uh, there's a storm and he's like, oh, God, don't let me die. And, <laughs> yes. and a lot of the people are freaking out. And these Christians, uh, these German speaking Protestants, they are not freaking out. They're just like, mm. you know, they're peaceful. And yeah. anyways, that troubles him that he is troubled and they're not. Mm. Once he gets off the voyage, one of those guys asks him. Do you have assurance of salvation? Mm. And that's when he realized, or he he says at that point, he realized he didn't have true faith in Jesus. Mm. So um, those are some of the highlights, some of the background for John Wesley. And um, from that point on, you know, however you interpret it, he was a man on fire. Um, revival yeah, preaching everywhere he went. He has a complicated, interesting life story, but it's it's fascinating and much of it is great. So yeah, I love that, and I love like um, as you mentioned, like his encounters with like these Moravians. If anyone's heard of the history yeah. of like Count Zinzendorf or the history of the Moravians, and yeah, just I love that encounter that he has to give him. I think at Aldersgate Gate, where he says like my heart was strangely warmed. This, yes. this this assurance that he is a child of God that I think only the Holy Spirit births in us, um, right. that assurance that you're a son of God and a child of God. I love that. Um, so, yeah, can you maybe dive into, like, what's he known for? Like, what are some of his big works, sermons, or, like, events that happened through John Wesley? Mm. Uh, what are, yeah, what, what are the big things that John Wesley is known for? John, John Wesley, so a- a- after all that, you know, he... Methodism becomes Methodism. Like his little yeah. movement, his little movement turns into a denomination. He was a very good organizer. And so he would do these big revival preaching sermons out in, you know, out in fields and stuff like that. And then he would get people connected to these kind of small groups. I mean, the idea of small groups literally started with John Wesley. And so Crazy. he basically took the Holy Club and mm-hmm. readapted it uh, more for this setting. And so he would take the revival meetings and they get people plugged in. Typically there was one teacher, there was 11 other, um, wow. there was 11 other people and they were called classes um, oftentimes. Mm-hmm. And anyways, the, 
the genius of it was <laughs> he was training people who were part of the laity yeah, to actually wow. lead some of these small groups. Yes. And that's really when it was that methodology that really called mm. is, is what they took as Methodism. And so he'd wow. probably be most know, known for his involvement with like George Whitfield and mm. the revival preaching and, and, and things like that. And then also just his ministry philosophy seeped into a lot of evangelical churches today. Mm. Um, in terms of like some of his theological things that he brought to the table, it's it's probably what, what, what I alluded to earlier, and we could dive into maybe more specifics of this, um, but it's definitely to this personal devotion to Jesus, mm, this personal beautiful. devotion. Mm. You can touch. In other words, you can mm. touch, grasp, hear, see him for yourself. Mm. So and good. there was much of that in the second great awakening, that kind of jargon that was not mm. always positive. Um, it was a little at times, not from John Wesley, but from other preachers at times, it was almost like pitting academic Christianity or even the Catholic mm. or the Orthodox church or whatever it is, the Anglican church against uh, you know, against kind of these revival preachers, but they weren't all that way. And John Wesley, yeah. for the most part, um, mm. John Wesley believed in the sacraments. John Wesley, mm. you know, believed in the core essentials of the mm. faith. Yeah, um, even at even at the beginning, he was kind of suspect of people who are preaching not in churches. Mm. Um, so he, in my opinion, John Wesley, like everybody, is fallible, but he he had this cool bent where really educated well you know smart also at this yes, charismatic yeah. fire-breathing preacher yeah so that's why i love him yeah so cool yeah i love like when i studied some of his influence on the pentecostal movement because he's like known as the grandfather of pentecostalism yeah. but um i think the way that i boiled it down with his theology was that he added experience to the Wesleyan quadrilateral of like yes. interpretation. So yes. they had a uh, tradition, like reason, meaning or like reason. Yeah, yep. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Thank you. It's too yeah. early in yeah. the morning for me. Tradition, <laughs> reason, um, like the Bible scripture. And then he yeah. adds to that, um, experience. that trilateral yeah. thing. Um, he adds experience. And so then he adds that to his way of like interpreting like what's God doing in these revival meetings and stuff and is open then to, you know, like the gifts of the spirit moving and there's people prophesying and doing all this stuff, which, yeah, um, yeah I think just like opened the way, as you said, for that impact on evangelicalism and that personal devotion, that personal experience with the Lord. So, um, yeah. yeah, no, I love that. I love that. I I will say, I, I, I would actually be curious to hear maybe your thoughts on this as well. When I, I, I had this little book, it was like, it was like 120 um, people from church history that you should know or something like yeah. that. And it was just a brief description yeah. on each one. <laughs> and I, and I, and I remember reading about John Wesley and it just kind of goes over brief stuff. I don't even have the book anymore. It was like forever ago, but yeah. I remember reading that in high school, his little entry and feeling like. I resonated so deeply with that. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. get rid of your dead religion. And, you know, yeah. like, you know, like be filled with all these, but like, you know, that Pentecostal <laughs> talk. Right. But the older I got, um, mm -hmm. like I had friends who were in, who, who were part of that movement as well. Mm -hmm. And it felt like they cared less and less about the context of scripture and all these other things. Mm -hmm. And it drove me to kind of pendulum swing to wow. the other side of it. Yes. And, and I, I found this hunger and desire of like, yeah, I believe in the gifts mm. of tongues and the prophetic and all the stuff. Mm. I have that. I feel like I'm part of a tree with no roots and wow. everybody's just like, you know, my Bible in me. Mm. And, um, and so anyways, all that being said, mm. I have found that in, in talking with some of my friends, when it comes to Christianity, some of them mm. do feel like a tree without roots and some of them mm. feel like, a, you know, feel like um, a Christian without the Holy Spirit. Wow. And I think that's why I love John Wesley. He itches yes. both of those things and brings them together. But yes. I despise both of the extremes because they just lead to weird, mm. dangerous spots. At least absolutely it, in my perspective. And, so and it was never meant to be like that. Like um, I'm actually doing my PhD on this exact thing of oh, wow. like, rooting Pentecostalism in the ancient faith, yes. ancient Christianity, um, and looking at like how 
how consistent it can be with mm. like some ancient ideas of like like we fit quite well within that sort of Catholic idea of the sacraments and the mysteries yeah. and all this sort of stuff that I think people just don't know what they don't know, you know. So I was like, yeah, we don't need anything. When the Catholics all had dry religion and they're right. all heretics and whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. But, yeah, there. I, I think God is raising up a, a group of Pentecostals that are or like charismatics, evangelicals, yeah. who really are in search of those ancient roots um, and yeah. it's not antithetical to to our yes. beliefs or, or foundations. Absolutely. I, I think if I had to sum up the message of um, mm. the message of John Wesley, if I had to sum it up to one idea or maybe two ideas, it would be mm. it's not just enough to preach the gospel. People need to respond to it. There needs to be an actual response. Mm. And Great. Um, yeah. And the response the, the the response to the gospel message. It, uh, jo John Wesley actually talks about this quite a bit in some of his sermons, <laughs> but yeah. it has to be a holistic response. It was mm. like C.S. Lewis who yeah. said, God doesn't want part of you. He wants you. Mm. Like, I think it's those two so ideas. Good. And um, yes. definitely, I think the pendulum swing can be is that people have to have a certain type of experience of a conversion. Mm. And I would go, no, the experience can look different for every single person. But yeah, totally. there does need to be a conversion. Um, oh, this is yes. what I was going to ask you earlier that I wanted to hear your thoughts yeah. on. Because on this <laughs> subject, um, I was talking to somebody else actually from uh, a friend of mine that we would both know. And he disagrees <laughs> with me on this. But this is how this is just my perspective. I tell him that if you ask me when mm. I got saved, it's like asking me mm. what day I hit puberty. Yeah. I'm like, I have no idea. I just know that something changed <laughs> after yeah. after puberty. Yeah. But I, yeah. I feel like I feel like Timothy. I had this faith that was in my grandparents <laughs> and then it was in my parents yes. and it just was deposited yeah. into me. There was a moment like Timothy where it was like, yeah, I need to kindle and fan into flame the gift mm. that's in me. But I always believe yeah. Jesus was Lord. I mean, and so I think for some people that experience can be this progressive thing. Totally. Totally. Thing. And for some people it's this 180 flip where like you were, you know, like a John Wesley thing, mm. there, just a, a moment of a 180 turn happens. So hundred percent. I don't know if you would, I I think, if you'd I... articulate it differently or not, but no, I think that the puberty idea is hilarious. Like, yeah, it's a great way to yeah. explain it. Um, I can totally resonate with that. I think like, especially what, if you're young and you have no sort of concept of like, I was this way and now I'm this way. It's not like you walked into a church when you were 25 and were living like right. a heathen and then all of a sudden the lights came on. So, yeah, yeah. I think it, that totally makes sense. Absolutely. Because I, I think I felt yeah, growing I up you like – you have to have, have to pinpoint it. Yeah. I, oh, I just think growing up I felt like I didn't have a testimony. Like I couldn't – like I couldn't – my testimony would not go viral <laughs> and I'm like if I'm going to if I'm gonna win somebody <laughs> over to Jesus, it's going to be through like – you know, like a prophetic word, or it's going to be like yes. through um, apologetics, <laughs> because I'm not going to yep. go to them and be like, yeah, you know, I was running a cartel. And when yeah. I was in jail, <laughs> I was sentenced to a thousand years and Joyce Meyer was there yeah. visiting that day. And, you know, and I said, Lord, send Joyce Meyer, if that's really you. And yeah. jo boom, there's Joyce Meyer. And now I preach all over the world, you know, and, and like, I just, I'm like, I don't have that story. And as I yeah. got older, I just yeah. realized, oh, that's that's not how it has to happen, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and and yeah. like I've heard it also said like the power of that testimony is that you had something, you had something that was so good that you never had to leave it. Yeah. Like you never yeah. walked away from it. You're like, like so if you find the real thing, you don't need to yeah. go like searching for something else. So I think it just proves that like, yeah, you're satisfied in God and there's something real to this Christianity because you don't have an emptiness that's searching for, you know, drugs or whatever, cartel life. Yeah. The cartel <laughs> yeah. life. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I, um, the puberty <laughs> illustration I used uh, in my, in my chapter for the Theo starter pack book, mm. because I oh, literally, wow. I lit I literally was like, that is that is something where it is so evident before and after. Yeah. Like yes. internally, yeah. physically, yeah. everything. 
So good. And we know we know that it kind we can if we looked at pictures or like we try to remember we know around when it starts and around mm. when it ends. But yes. there's it, it, and so there's a clear difference, but it's it's so gradual you don't know. Yes. Um. And so, anyways, uh, that's just that. how it's yeah. That's how it's been for. That 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 that's my testimony. <laughs> yeah, but, I love it. Such, yeah. such a great explanation. Um. Yeah. So maybe let's dive into like what effects has John Wesley had on the church, and then like why should we know him in this 21st century contemporary context that we're in. <laughs> Why do you think like it's important to read on Wesley and to know Wesley's story and um, to engage with him? Yeah. So I'm going to answer the the second part, like why we should um, first. But mm. yeah. Um, have you ever have you ever read the book Total Truth by Nancy Piercy? Yes. Yes. Really. So I I read that book. I, I don't know three or four years ago or so. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe longer. I don't remember. But um, <laughs> I remember towards the end of the book, I had, I had read and heard stuff about the first great awakenings, but I never had somebody piece it all together mm-hmm. like she did. I remember mm-hmm. reading that just like going, wow. Now, whether someone mm-hmm. agrees or disagrees with her assessment, it was fascinating because I think it's important for everybody, especially if they're somebody who's serious about wanting to study the Bible, everything we believe comes from somewhere in the past. And mm-hmm. it's good to know where our ideas or our methods yes. or our conclusions mm-hmm. come from. And to mm-hmm. give an example of that book, I remember reading about the first adaptations of an altar call. And I remember going, wow. okay, yeah. this is this is good to know because there is there is pros and cons like there is with everything to how we do mm-hmm. certain things. And I want to be aware yes. of where this can go and it can drip into emotionalism. So I just think pr- mm. principally it will, yeah. it will be so helpful just to know where your thoughts and your mm-hmm. ideas and all this stuff comes from. So anyways, so just good. generally speaking, I think that's helpful. I think, I think people should read John Wesley because if you don't like the binary of um, <laughs> God is in control <laughs> of everything and you, you literally do nothing. I'm, I know it's yeah. a strong hand, but like you get what yeah. I'm saying that, that, yeah. you know, that like, there, there, it's almost like there's no personal responsibility. There's yeah. no free will. You are a robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. Yeah. Like God has predetermined every single thing up for, you mm. know, and then there's the other extreme of like, yeah, God's just kind of waiting around. Like if you don't like mm. these binaries mm. and you're like, there's more of a paradox here. Um, yeah. yeah, a professor from my old Bible college used to say all truth is held in tension. And, um, mm. you know, it's like two, two ropes with stakes in the ground. They hold up the tent. Mm. Uh, I, John Weston doesn't do this perfect, but I do think he accomplishes a lot of this. Um, yes. he does accomplish this tension. Yeah. And so I think that's why people should read John Wesley. Uh, we, I think we were mentioning this at the beginning, but um, mm. his view of grace, he, he believes that God mm. gives grace to all people and that's mm. how they're able to respond. It's not, yes. they don't receive grace after they respond. Mm. There's a, there's an element of grace that's on every single person so mm-hmm. that they can respond and they can mm-hmm. receive more grace, the saving initial grace of Jesus. Yes. And Come so, on. He talks about that. He talks about sanctification mm-hmm. a lot. He's big in mm-hmm. holiness. Luther, sometimes it feels like he might be allergic <laughs> to talking about some <laughs> of the things that Wesley goes into. And, you know, there's reasons That's for awesome. that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but Wesley is not scared. Now, listen, you know, like mm-hmm. every single person from church history, um, mm-hmm. they they sometimes swing pendulums from from the abuses yeah, that they see. It's true. Uh, yes, but John, yes. but, but John Wesley he believed that people could fully have a heart and a mind and a body fully devoted to God Mm, without sin. It was called Christian perfectionism. And um, he believed that sanctification was an initial act and a progressive one. And, you know, so I I think if you want to see somebody with some, with nuance and who does feel like they do a good job of pulling the tension both ways, 
I think John mm. West is a good person to look into. And that's why I, I appreciate him. And the last thing I would say so is, good. especially if you live in North America, I'm not too familiar yeah. with the, the other countries. I mean, mm -hmm. um, because I don't live there, but especially North America. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. <laughs> a lot, yeah, thank you. A <laughs> yeah. lot of the denominations that are here and the movements that are here have been heavily impacted, whether you know it or not, by yeah. Wesley and a yeah. lot of the stuff that flows from him. So Yes. That's so good. You made so many good points there, um, Austin. And like, I think one of them that I just want to highlight for people is like, you talked about Luther being reactionary to the context that he's in and, and same, same deal with Wesley and anyone that we study throughout church history. Um, like, I think sometimes we just look at them as if they're in like a little Christian bubble, there's nothing going on around them. And we look at their theology in this box of like, you know, take it out and, and look at it in yeah. the 21st century. But I think it's so important to actually study the context around them to see mm. why they were so like defiant against this and why they were so hard hitting on that. And yeah. Um, yeah, I love that. And also just that point about Wesley just holding truths in tension. Like I definitely see that in his writing as you were talking, like um, he studied a lot of the like Eastern fathers and, um, like he looked at the early church fathers, he looked at like church history and stuff like that. And like to the point where some Protestants would say like, oh, like Wesley was like a Catholic Protestant. Like he's yeah. he's gone so deep into these church fathers. Um, but I think it definitely just makes for just a more well-rounded, historically informed um, just like theology that encompasses the vastness of of god and these ideas and like right. that are, that are so big that you know you can't necessarily just like put them into like as you said calvinism armenianism like it's one or the other and if you like are on the opposite right. one to me you're completely wrong like yeah so i love that about him and i love that you mentioned like as as evangelicals pentecostals charismatics like it he's such a good one to look to for that like depth of foundation in the word, in reason, in tradition, and yeah. then also like adding this real personal experience, devotion to the Lord. Um, yeah, progress, progressive like holiness and, and journey of sanctification. And yeah, I love all those well, things. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's so true. Like it's so much of it is both and in the Christian life. Yeah. So much of it yes. is both and. It's like – um it's like I could never go to my dad growing up and say, hey, dad, I want to have a relationship, personal <laughs> relationship with you, but I am yeah. not going to dinner. <laughs> I don't want to be around my siblings. My dad would be like, that's yeah. not how this works, dude. You don't yeah, get a personal what? relationship apart from the family. And part of what God is trying to do in all of our lives mm. is not just make us a yeah. good son or daughter, but a good brother or sister. Mm. And so wow. that's why he's like, you got to get to the table. And this is why like. Yeah. Come on, let's do this. And so Wesley does, he, uh, I can't remember the mm. term he uses, but the term I remember that I'm going to use yeah. is like yeah, his yeah, yeah. social holiness. He believed mm. that um, wow. to, to actually fulfill a Christian life. I mean, this is a mm -hmm. pretty much every Christian believes this, but he really mm -hmm. emphasized it. If you really want to fulfill yes. the Christian mandate, if you want to grow in holiness, if you want to... Mm -hmm. um, grow in spiritual disciplines, you have to do that within community with other yes. people. And yes. really throughout his whole life, throughout his whole life, mm. he's always integrating himself within some sort mm. of community. Wow. Um, from college to the Methodist movement to, to all of it. So mm. um, yeah, I really appreciate that about mm. him uh, because I love the church. Mm. Yes. And getting coffee with your friends on a Saturday morning mm. and reading your Bible is not yeah. church. That's getting yeah. coffee with your friends. <laughs> yes. With Christian this friends. Is so yeah. shocking. That's, a, that's a Christian Christian hobby, Christian activity. Yeah. Where two or three are gathered. <laughs> yeah. That's where amen. he is. I'm like, oh. Like But it's not church, yeah. That would be like yeah, saying Yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was gonna say people's ecclesiology is like so <laughs> so weak these days. And that's what I love what you were talking about before. Like we need to be rooted in like the ancient faith and like to know these concepts of like what is church? What does church actually mean? What defines being part of the church and being 
brothers and sisters in Christ, you know. Yeah. Sorry, what were you going to say? No, it's just, I, <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> I But like, I remember going to a Seattle Seahawks <laughs> football game. For those who yeah. maybe are, are not part of this country, it, it, um, it's recorded to be the loudest <laughs> American football, the loudest stadium in American Whoa. football in the entire country. And I wow. went there for a game and it is, I mean, it's in Seattle, Washington, in the top left corner of the US. And it is booming loud, booming wow. loud. And I could, I, I bet you out of <laughs> however many thousands of people that are there, let's just make up a number of yeah. 40,000 people. I don't know. Yeah. I, I bet you there's at least a thousand Christians in attendance. And I yeah, could go yeah, yeah. where two is or three church? are gathered. Yeah. Well, what, well, like it's, I'm I'm being sarcastic, you know, tongue in cheek here, but I'm just, yeah. Anyways, um, the logic of it, the logic of it is just stupid. (laughs) Yeah. The logic of it is just stupid. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So go, go get coffee with your friends and all that. And that's great. um, Yeah. It's just studying the Bible together. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think sort of what you were talking about, Wesley's like um, value for the sacraments. I think when we have such a light understanding of like our ecclesiology and the sacraments and stuff, we start to have all sorts of concepts of the church. But when we understand like the power of baptism, the power of corporate worship, the power of like the Eucharist participating in communion together and the broken yeah. body and blood of Jesus and what that does. And like all these different sacraments that we do, even like the anointing with oil from, from yes. the elders and stuff like that. Yes. It's all so important and so powerful. And it's not just a symbolic thing. I think where we have this like deep right. understanding of what that actually does, um, we probably would reverence the church a bit more than we do and like mm-hmm. see it as holy and sacred and something that, you know, we need to be a part of. I can't, can't remember if it was Athanasius. I'm like, my brain's not working this morning, but one of the church fathers said, you can't have God as your father if you don't have the church as your mother. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so it's, it's so true. Like you, you can't be a Christian outside of the community of yeah. the church and the fellowship of the believers. That's what it yeah. means to be Christian is to be part of this community. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it, when it, when it comes to sacraments, yes, I, I agree with everything you mm. just said. There was a book I read, um, yeah. on sacramental the- theology. Um, awesome. this had to have been like in 2015, I think. And mm-hmm. that book is the first book that, I had such a deep curiosity for church history and um, I'm no, you know, I'm not no master at church history or or claim to be, but I really love it. I love reading it. Mm. And that book led me there because I just assumed growing up Luther and Calvin were the ones who were like, what up with this bread and wine, dude? This is just a symbol. I just assumed that. (laughs) I just thought, oh, this has to be, this has to be old Calvin. You know, <laughs> and yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And, and I realized, wow, Calvin, the stuff he says about the Eucharist was wow. mind blowing. I'm like, this dude is so smart. Like, I actually think mm. that's my favorite subject to read Calvin wow. about. He's insane. Wow. I am so good at that. And Luther had great stuff as well. Um, and yeah, anyways, for me, it just, uh, it opened up my eyes to go, wow, mm. so many people. That doesn't mean we have to mm. have a certain particular vision of it but it is funny when i've mm. talked to friends about sac the sacraments mm. of the church and they're a little bit hesitant mm. at times i go dude did you ever get anointing oil slapped on your head growing up at your the prophetic assembly yeah. that's what we called them growing up the three and a half <laughs> hour services amazing. that would last four nights in a row <laughs> and if you and if you wore a bright color somebody would walk up to you and go are you trying to get prophesied yeah. over uh, and, and, yeah. like yeah, yeah like all like, we're no, all I worshiping just like colors yeah we're all worshiping and like the the prophets walk in and we're all like you know you know pretend you're not looking you <laughs> <Yeah>. know <laughs> and, 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 and and i'm like so you do believe that god works through a physical means yeah you know mm-hmm. when when they do when they use anointing oil there is something yes. particular and yes. unique there and they're, and they're like well okay i mean i guess like, <laughs> right exactly 
So absolutely, anyways, we got on a tangent there, but yeah, I love I love the no, beauty lo- of the sacraments it. of the church. Yeah, and I think it's so important because like diving into these topics, I think that that's what brings church history to life because it's not just like we're studying yes. this guy from like this time period who did great things. Like no, yes. we like his understanding of the sacraments or whatever can actually change our whole perspective on church. They can change yeah. our churches. They can change our experience. Yeah. Like I was talking to this um, pastor uh, in Australia a few weeks ago and we were just talking about this idea of the sacraments and baptism and he's a pastor of a pe- very large Pentecostal church and they had done some statistics on people's conversion experience so they uh, people would get saved and then they would go through you know a foundation class and and then they'd get baptized and be serving in church and different things like that they had certain markers for each person and they had stats on like thousands of people maybe five thousand that he was talking about over a certain period of time and he made a comment that he's like yeah I noticed that like those who got baptized were like like the percentage of like staying around in church and serving and growing in their faith and stuff was like almost like a hundred percent or something compared to those who didn't get baptized wow. and I was like yeah that totally makes sense because like you know this is what happens in baptism and this is what we see in the church fathers and stuff and so he was seeing it experientially but not necessarily having that you know that sacramental theology and and backing of church history and stuff there but it was totally playing out in in church. So I think if we can marry those things together and say like, okay, this is what happens in baptism uh, from what we what we read in the church fathers and great minds right. that that you're talking about, like Luther, Calvin, Wesley, and stuff. I think it would just make people like, oh wow, okay, we have to we have to teach people about baptism. We have to get them baptized because you know that's yeah. going to actually be a catalyst for their faith and for their, for their Christian walk, you know, um, it's yeah. not just a symbol. I just can't imagine, you know, a Pentecostal and, you know, <laughs> Zwingli, um, yeah. person going up, going up to, uh, going up to Peter, you know, and ax. And he's like, repent, believe me, be baptized. And then be like, Hey Pete, could you just clarify? They don't have to get yeah. baptized. Right. Yeah. It's, can you just like clarify wait, that wait one? five years, wait 10 can, years they yeah, when like, they're ready. It's not, yeah. it's not actually that important, right, Pete? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you'd be like, why don't you shut up? Jesus commanded yeah. us, you know? So, oh, um, but here's the funny thing is like, like, let's just think about this. You and I believe that mm-hmm. when a 40 year old dude on a stage playing the mm-hmm. bass and, mm-hmm. you know, a bunch mm-hmm. of other singers are singing just singing and people are standing at yeah. the front with hands being laid on them. They can encounter God. We believe that, wow. mm-hmm. you know, it's like, we believe we can encounter God in those altar call moments mm. and during worship. Yeah. Why, I, I have no, why is it so weird to think that we could encounter God mm. through physical means? Why, why is it, why mm. does it have to be immaterial stuff? So, um, anyways, yes. I know we're, we're going down this, but <laughs> Down this whole path. No, I love but it. I think it's so if important. We, it's if so Pentecostals, important. Be, Pentecostals believe all the weird mm-hmm. stuff. Great. Yes. Yes. Except for the sacramental weird stuff. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. Totally. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I like, I, I love believing in all the weird stuff. Yeah. I yeah. And, all, and I think so. they go to, I actually believe that they go together. Yes. Like, I, th- they do. I think, yeah. Um, <laughs> like, the, uh, I can't remember who explained it to me like this. I think it was just a book I was reading on the Church Fathers, but they were talking about the incarnation of Christ, and yeah. we never we never think like, oh yeah, Jesus could have come as a spirit and made a way for yes. us, died on a cross, atoned for us. He actually physically, with his yeah. body, died yeah. on a cross, shed his physical blood for us, and so yeah. there was something as you were talking like material to administering that atonement and salvation to us. And so why would we think that, you know, all of our experience with God should be immaterial? As you were saying, like, no, it should, like the material actually can help to administer those spiritual, supernatural things to us as well. Um, Yeah. And it's a very important part of it. So, yeah. Yeah, you Like nobody has, nobody that's watching or listening to this has ever had a relationship with anybody Mm. That is not a, a, yeah. a material. Yeah. You know, like it's literally totally. like you, you, it, it's, 
Yeah. So um, it's it's how we interact with every single person, mm. and uh, we're like we're doing this right now over the interwebs. But um, yeah. I, I presume if you could, you would rather do these like in person. There there is something there is something yeah, unique and different in person. Yeah. But um, absolutely. Yeah, and that's why. And honestly, it's this. It's um, everything you've said, you know, this both and this is why I appreciate you. And like, I mm-hmm. loved your session when I was at the Theos Leader Retreat, um, you know, a year and a half ago or so. And why I love following you online. <laughs> um, you're strong in your convictions. Oh, thanks, you, you, you really do. I mean, you are a, you are a Pentecostal. I love that. But you also have this great appreciation <laughs> and hunger for church history and for theology and things like that. And I think... Um, I think that's the, I think that's what people are craving is both of those things. So come on. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. And same to you. Like, I think, I think the Lord's really raising us as a generation uh, of people who do have that both and like spirit and truth. And I'm excited for the future. We were both at a conference recently, a Theos conference in Palm Springs and Pastor Jude Fuquay, I don't know if his message had the same effect on you, but when he talked about like the future of the church being Mm. um, spirit, scripture and sacrament, I was Mm -hmm. like, yes, spirit, scripture and sacraments. I love that. Um, Oh, no, sorry, you weren't at that conference. Were you like, what the heck? I'm like, oh, I was like, oh, oh cool. why does hey, he hey, think Le- it was Le- good? It was great yeah. talking to you. You're like looking at me like. I'm just kidding. Like- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, because it's like Theos, I feel like you're there. You're there like just I'm there the ghost spirit. of Austin Malt is around. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, so funny. I, oh, yeah. I, I preached a sermon at our church last year, literally yeah. titled Spirit, Scripture, and Sacrament. No. Wow. I'm not joking. That was, wow. that was, uh, yeah, last year I preached a sermon at our church called that. So, wow, yeah, I love that's that. so I prophetic. Agree. So prophetic. Yeah. And I think when we talk about like revival and reformation, I think part of that reformation of the church that the Lord is bringing is back to spirit, scripture, sacrament. And yeah, I love that. Yeah. Love that you guys are on that. So good. Yeah, so, he, um, he actually maybe, just stole my notes. So, Pastor Jude just stole yeah, my yeah, notes. Yeah, exactly. That's, Pastor Jude, yeah, yeah, he's he was watching you online. He's like, oh, this is a good one from Austin. Yeah. Better steal All it. Right, I know he's right. not going to be at the conference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, so do you have any favorite quotes from Wesley or anything that he said that has particularly marked you? Um, anything that you love from him? There's not a particular quote that I, that I have. Um, well... I, I don't remember. I probably should have written it down, but he does talk about how um, he essentially he's in this spot before he has this experience where mm. he's, he has doubts and the doubts have arisen, mm. have arose from two things. Mainly number one his some mm-hmm. of his failures in ministry and number two, mm. his, um, his inability to have victory over sin. Wow. And, yeah. um, I definitely think that I related to that because I have, I had felt in my life like failures in what I've done and um, Mm. an inability to overcome, whether it be an insecurity or, Mm. you know, yeah, a sin or whatever it is. And I don't believe that there's some pixie dust magic formula prayer where if you go forward yeah. for, um, you know, yeah, I've just been insecure or I can't hear God or <laughs> lust, pride, greed, gluttony. I mean, whatever it is, you name it. I don't believe you can go forward for some deliverance prayer. And every time God's like, boom, you know, God, like there yeah, is a the process yeah. <laughs> of repentance. But um, yes, I do. But regardless of what that process mm. looks, looks like. John Wesley uh, attests to this. I can attest to this. Mm. The process has to be fueled by the power of the Holy Spirit yeah, to overcome totally. sin. So I, yes, there's a quote where he talks about how I kept falling and rising and falling mm. and rising. He writes that wow. in his journal talking about his struggle with um, sin. And that moment, I remember reading that just going, mm. I know. Yeah, I've been there. Wow. 
And we had this encounter with the Holy Spirit. It was like breakthrough in his life. So I think that would have been my favorite moment. Um, Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. And I love like just that idea that he brings about like the changing of the affections of the heart. Yes. There's like a a bent now towards holiness and righteousness and the the Holy Spirit sort of like drawing you into. I love that. Now that's awesome, man. Um, Yeah. Do you have any like any like quirks or funny stories about John Wesley or anything like that that you've come across in his writings or his oh. life? <laughs> I, I I should have written one down. I don't have um, anything off the top of my head. I do know that at yeah. one spot he mentioned something, and this is more funny in the ironic sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, not as in like. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's a bad t- bad take. Um, yeah, he had said something to the extent of uh, the Christian life doesn't really begin until you have mm. total victory over sin. I remember reading wow. that, going, "Yeah." Now it, it's unclear what he means by that. It's a little mm. ambiguous because it's like, are you saying yeah. that until we reach that Christian perfectionism, like that kind of yeah. is counter wow. everything you've said? So I don't think it could have meant that, but I remember reading that the first time going, is this guy like losing his marbles at this point? Like, is he like off his rocker? Like, so has the Christian life not started for me? You know, like it it was just kind of funny and ironic sense. That's the only thing I could think of that I thought was weird. And uh, if I treat him charitably, I go, that's probably, he probably doesn't mean that the way I'm interpreting it, but it was just a funny thing to read. Yes. Yeah, no, totally. Christian, That's yeah. so awesome. So is there anything else, um, Pastor Austin, that we should know about Wesley or if people want to get into Wesley, like is there a particular thing that they you would sort of direct them to to start? Um, any other things that we should know about Wesley? You know, um, I would tell people you could obviously like look up stuff on John Wesley's life and it's fascinating and it's good. Mm-hmm. Um One book that I really recommend to people who, if they've Mm -hmm. never read anything from church history or very little, Mm -hmm. but they want to dive in and they want to go just a little deep in a bunch of different areas. Um, Mm -hmm. Water from a Mm -hmm. Deep Well was written by a Mm -hmm. professor that's actually just two hours away from here at a school called Whitworth University. And Mm -hmm. Water from a Deep Well, I heard about this book from John Mark Comer. Not like directly. Wow. <laughs> he didn't call me. Yeah, we're uh, having a chat. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but he was doing he was doing a conference and it was in a Q and A mm-hmm. and he had recommended mm-hmm. it. This is a long time ago, and I went and bought the book. I had read some mm-hmm. stuff on church history, but it was so refreshing. And there's a chapter mm-hmm. in there all about conversion. Mm-hmm. And it's all about wow. John Wesley, but it's really cool. I don't know if you've read that book or heard about it before. But no, never it, it heard talks of it. a little bit about the monastic movement. And it's, it's really great. Wow. It gives you just some highlight stuff on like yeah. 13 different, it goes to the Catholic church. What can we learn from them? It talks about wow. all kinds of stuff. And it's really, really, really good. Um, and Very there's a chapter cool. yeah, on I'll John Wesley it and it will make you appreciate it. And if you are somebody who's like mm. a theological utilitarian, you want, you want to find <laughs> the best stuff from each. This is a great yeah. primer for that. Great primer for that. Very cool. So that w- that's one of my favorite resources to tell people um, who yeah, want to start diving awesome. in. Water from a deep well. Just just look that up on Very Amazon. Cool. It will light your heart on fire. So I love that. Love that. Amazing. I and mean, if people want to connect with you, Pastor Austin, how can they get in touch with you? Go visit your church. You're on Instagram. How can we get yeah. hold of you? Um, you? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. I'm on all the... I'm on all social media. It's just <laughs> at Austin Molt. Um, yep. And I also have like a, a course on youth ministry. And if people want to check out that and they're interested, awesome. you know, maybe they're a youth pastor or aspiring to be one, they can mm-hmm. go to austinmolt.com. So yeah, at Austin Molt, yes, austinmolt.com. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm just thankful to be here. So thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you so much, my friend. I love this conversation. Um, 
stuff that I'm so passionate about. And I, I love that you're passionate about this sort of stuff as well. Yeah. And I, I just, it warms my heart to see, you know, a generation of, of yes. young preachers that God is leading in this direction. So, so exciting. So cool. Thank you so much um, for being with us today. And thank you for everyone else who's joined us on the Eagle and Child podcast. We will see you next time. Bye. Thanks so much for tuning into the Eagle and Child podcast. That's all from us for today. If you want to support us, you can like, subscribe or drop us a review. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Eagle and Child podcast. We'll catch you next time. Much love.